talks about. And uh, there's someone in the audience who speaks very, very often about how social networking will help Kaiser Permanente, and that is Dr. Ted Eton. Okay, good afternoon. Um, let's do a little roll call, because I think we have some visitors from all over the Kaiser Permanente nation. Um, so let's see, is anyone here from Hawaii? I thought that was a stretch. Okay, um, Southern California. Yay! Northern California. Hooray, whoa, okay. Uh, Northwest, Portland. Northwest Group Health Cooperative. Yay! Uh, let's see, we have Colorado. Yay, there's two people. Ohio? Okay. Georgia. Excellent. Welcome, Georgia. Mid-Atlantic states. Great. And then um, there are people remotely on WebEx that Jan Ground is working with, and so please let Jan know where you're from, so we're going to do the virtual roll call at the same time. One from Hawaii online, fantastic, okay. So um, with that, um, this is the image that uh, I uh, was given permission to use by Regina Holiday, who's a patient, and she painted this at a meeting that I was at with her about six months ago, and in the, I'll just describe it. In the foreground is a patient with their PHR, and so she gave this image of the patient with the PHR, which is a little toy, and this is outside of Kaiser Permanente. In the background, you see um, two doctors with a jump rope that's information going back and forth, and a hospital administrator jumping up and down, and hospital administrators um, standing in line to jump and enjoy all that um, networking and technology. In the back is Care Pages. Uh, has anyone heard of Care Pages? Raise your hand. So Care Pages is a service that hospitals use, including Kaiser Permanente, that allows people in the hospital to share experiences about their hospitalization. As Regina described, the problem that she had with Care Pages is it wasn't connected to the real world. So she was sharing her husband's dying in the hospital on Facebook. So her dream was that Facebook and Care Pages would get married, and that's the just married there. So her idea was, is why the segregation between the personal health record and the people that are um, having all the connections in, in the healthcare industry. And by the way, I work for the Permanente Federation, which supports all the medical groups of Kaiser Permanente, and I'm a family doc based in DC. So we're gonna do this in four parts. This is a, was a hard subject to think about presenting, so I'm gonna do it this way, because I'm gonna start with care delivery. So um, I think I'm gonna say that Kaiser Permanente is the best place to have this conversation, because we are a place where we are doing really, really good things with care delivery. We're doing a very good job. So I'm gonna focus on one example, and that's mammography. So this example is that we are number one in the nation in mammography screening. We have been so for about three years. Um, we're on the left, we, we uh, pool our measures with group health, so with us and them, we're number one in the country, and then it kind of goes down from there. So there's the 90th percentile, which is below us, the uh, median for HMOs and um, PPOs. And this is how we do it, and I'm gonna show a video for that. I think it was the, towards the end of September. I had had a real cold. I mean, a real old-fashioned cold that I hadn't had in years. It aggravated my asthma, so I made an appointment to see Dr. Agab. When I came into allergies, Susan was the receptionist that greeted me. I gave my card and everything, and she goes, oh, Mary, she goes, you're due for a mammogram. I go, I know, Susan, I'll get it done, I'll make the appointment. And she goes, no, let me make it for you. And I go, I'll make it, I've made it and I've canceled it. Because that was almost a year, I'm going on two years that I hadn't done it, and I do it faithfully. And she goes, I'm not gonna let you get out of here until you make your appointment. So I told her, get me something after two o'clock. And she was able to get me in at 2.30 on the day I asked her. And when I had the mammogram, and then from there it just snowballed. I mean, like that was the 10th, like a, the 15th, I got the call the 16th, I had a second mammogram and an ultrasound. The 17th, I had a biopsy. The 18th, I got a call from the surgeons. And the following Thursday, I was in to see the surgeon. They were very, very thorough with it. And I talked to one of my friends. She goes, God, I didn't get any of that. I go, well, I have Kaiser. I don't know what you have. I'm really happy that she did push me to make the appointment because I probably would have waited till December. Like I say, it might have been too late for that. I'm, be, I'm, I'm one of the, I consider myself one of the lucky ones. I owe a lot to Susan. So this is relevant because this doesn't happen by accident. You have to have a comprehensive electronic health record and you have to have leadership. So did you notice that she presented her allergist office? 
Outside of Kaiser Permanente, it is unheard of that a specialist would actually tell you about a pap smear due or mammography due. There's many, many videos on IdeaBook, our internal social network, of podiatrists, patients talking about podiatrists telling them that they needed their pap smear. That's normal. Jeff Benabio is here. Where is he? Raise your hand. Dermatologist. Um, he is graded on his ability to get colorectal cancer screening done for his patients. Um, so it's not easy to do that. And with that foundation, <laughs> right? How does it go? I, is, aren't you? OK. Um, so it, it takes that foundation to go to the next level. You have to be really good at care delivery. This is how we're sharing it. So we are also using sh um, social media to talk about it. So we had to recently retire that ad because the rights became too expensive for us. We respect people's music rights. But that was the viral video for us. So we have about, as Vince Gala, raise your hand, Vince, who manages this work. We have about 200 videos on YouTube, and that one video is responsible for uh, one third of the hits of all our videos on YouTube, which shows how compelling you can be to talk about health. Um, so with all that success, what's the problem? So here's the problem um, that we face um, from the patient perspective. So I gave a presentation like this in 2009 to a group of patients. And I gave this data at the time. Hawaii in the, at the time was number one. 83% of their women were getting their mammograms. And a patient in the back said, I want to know about the other 17%. So that was like, I, I'm still haunted by that moment because it makes me realize that for as much as we think we're number one in the country, we're better than anyone else. Um, there are still one out of five women that are not, not getting their mammograms, and it goes downhill from there. So if the median for PPOs is 67%, that's about um, one-third of women that are not getting their mammograms, and that's still acceptable in our country today. I've traveled all over the, the Kaiser regions, and when I talk to people about the, our abilities, I find the same kind of conversation. It's we don't want to be 90th percentile. We want 100% screened. We want to, and, and the other part is, we're trying to figure out who those other 17% are. So we're at this stage where we know exactly where they live, their anniversaries, their birth dates, our systems are so well, are so good, and we just want to get to make sure that everyone gets their mammogram screening. So for us, both our abilities and our desire to be perfect, that's why we're having this conversation. Um, and so what about the other 17%? So when I talk to people and about it, um, I, got, I kind of get the same responses. Um, well, I've called them a bunch of times, or I talked to colleagues, uh, I've been called a bunch of times. We, they, we look in their charts, there's nothing there. We're still trying to learn in this stage, now that we know who they are, what's going on with them. So today we're going to use a, a technique that um, the KPDR for folks have helped us with, which is personas. So, on the left there is Catherine. She's not a real person, but she's an amalgam of a lot of data and interviews about a kind of patient that's attracted to Kaiser Permanente. So as an example, she's 44, business owner, educated, high income, Northern California. She has multiple care gaps. She hasn't gotten her mammogram, and she's gotten seven calls. This actually does happen. Seven calls and hasn't gotten her mammograms. On the right, and, and so we ask ourselves, is she unmotivated? Does she not know she needs mammograms? Um, David Sobel, who's our expert in health education, told me, you know, Ted, everyone is motivated. The question is whether they're motivated about what you want them to be motivated at that time. And so for us, we need to discover what that is. And so um, Alex Drain, who's here, Alex, stand up. Yay, from Eliza Corporation. So she introduced me to some research that her, her company had done called The Unmentionables. Um, and she talked about sex, money, and a crappy boss, the unmentionable stressors that healthcare industry can't afford to ignore. Her company has a database of over 400 million phone calls using very engaging telephonic technology to interact with people that don't respond to the normal ways of telephone and email when we say just come in and do stuff. She also innovates with Ronnie Zeiger. Ronnie, stand up. Stand up. So Ronnie Zeiger, uh, MD, happens to be the chief health strategist for Google, but also does, I know him actually not through that, but just through his innovation work. So he's partnered with um, Alex on seducehealth.org. So that's another approach to make, they talk about making health sexy. So part of it is the messaging and part of it is listening. So Alex's team was kind enough to actually give me a recorded phone call from one of their patients that you could actually almost say is Catherine. So I'm going to play that. And I've been so busy at work and had problems at work that I had put off getting a, a mammogram and making an appointment. So I couldn't really remember how long it had been since my last mammogram and ultrasound. Uh, so I think what you're doing here is very important. And for me, it lets me know that I'm over two years past due. And since I've already had a double lumpectomy, that this service, I think, is extremely important. And I... So the part about that that blew me away is at the end, she's had a double lumpectomy, and she's willing to put her life on the line because her job is, is too demanding. That probably happens all the time. And I might, as a doctor, I would say, there's probably maybe something going on besides her job. But we don't know what that is, and yet she's not coming in for mammograms. 
And if this is happening all the time, I think we'd like to know some other ways to find out what is going on that is making not this a priority. Sometimes it's not her who has the priority over her health, it could be someone in her family. And, and we're just discovering what that could be. So that's uh, care delivery. Let's talk about uh, social networking and what we know about that. So Susanna Fox, stand up. Susanna Fox from the Pew Internet American Life Project. So she is the uh, internet geologist, the official one. Um, she has generated almost all the data that I've used and most people use to understand how people use the internet today. So this is um, data that she produced in 2005 about who, who uh, uses social networking sites. So let me ask, um, on the top is the uh, people using the internet, the blue is people using social networking sites, and on the very bottom is the generation, so age less than 30, 30 to 50, 50, 64, and 65 plus. Who here was using some sort of social networking in 2005? Raise your hand, any blogging or anything like that? So this is a little bit of an advanced audience, I'm gonna say. Who was using Twitter in 2005? Okay, good, trick question, didn't exist. All right, <laughs> I'm just checking, okay. So, um, and who isn't using it in 2011? So, as you can see, you know, the, the curves are now trending. I, I think when I talk to people that are under 30, which I am not, um, they don't say, I go use Facebook, I use social networking. They say, I just communicate with people online. They don't see the difference at all. So, we all know it's a big part of people's lives, so I won't, I won't belabor that point, but we understand that. Um, but here's where I've kind of had some interesting experiences where what is healthcare using it for today? And that's what kind of has rankled my feathers a little bit. Um, I was at a meeting um, a few months ago in Seattle about social media in, in healthcare. And it was real uncomfortable for me because people kept standing up and saying things like, we use social media at Hospital X because we can get people to come see this doctor and then they'll make an appointment with that doctor. And I thought, this just doesn't feel right. This doesn't seem like what we should be using it for. And then Vince Gala gave his presentation. He was talking about using video equipment and he made this comment that really kind of made it crystallize for me. He said, even as a communicator, we're trying to make healthcare more affordable. And that was my aha. It's that people are not using social media and healthcare to make it more affordable. They're using it to drive up the cost of care, to get more procedures and more things. And I don't think this is a permanente thing because Wendy Sue Swanson, please stand up, MD. Wendy Sue Swanson was, I'll stay up longer than that. Wave, okay. Um, so Wendy Sue Swanson was sitting next to me. She's a pediatrician at Seattle Children's. Um, she goes by Seattle Mama Doc. She's very well read. And she turned to me and she said, you know, I, I blogged about people tweeting about surgery and it kind of, it made me a little uncomfortable. So I looked up that blog post and I thought that was a pretty brave thing to do. So she blogged about how a hospital in her community was blogging about tweeting during surgery and how that just didn't fit, feel right for her, right? And so I interviewed her later and so she made this comment. Um, I wanna realign families with science. I don't want fear-based messages to dilute current evidence and science that helps us care for children. So I'm gonna say that most, if not all, healthcare providers, clinicians want to use social media for this way, but it's maybe not happening as much as we want. So part of me is trying to recruit us to do it, but the other part is how do we do it safely and, and um, with protection for our members. Okay, part three, the relationship. So this is a slide, this is the actual slide from 2002 that I gave to colleagues in Seattle when I was trying to pitch the idea of the personal health record. And so um, the colors and fonts were fascinating 10 years ago. Keynote was the first, Keynote 1.0. So I'll just modernize it for you here. Um, so, so back then I said, you know, here's the deal. When people think about um, getting, going to get health information, they still choose the doctor number one. Online is number two, but you know, that's gonna change. The way the internet's going, um, if we don't get on there, it's not gonna be about us anymore and we're gonna be, it's, it's not gonna be about healthcare. People get bad information from all weird places. And so I really thought that was gonna happen, and I was totally wrong, actually. So Susanna's data, she's tracked this over 10 years. In 2011, the percentage of people that say they, go to, they actually went to a health professional for care and support is 70%. So still in this world, we have access to all those resources. They're still choosing that relationship as important to them. And I was surprised by this data, but is the data. This is what people are saying they do, so I wanna respect that. And guess what, that's what we do really well here. So she also noted this year that um, social, network, uh, social network sites are only used sparingly for health updates and queries. So as much as social media is being used, people are still not, sh they're still not going to that place to share their health information and those numbers haven't changed since 2009, okay? So social media use in sharing health information, kind of flat, social media adoption huge, and then look at us. This is our personal health record. That's our adoption. It's, like, it's a hockey stick. Right, so that's another data point. Who here has ever read a story that personal health records are not, are not considered important by consumers? Who's been spread that in the news? So you read that in the news and then you look at our experience. What, what's different about us? We've got um, 
6, 6.2 million emails, 14 million test results, double digit growth for year to year. Um, I'm gonna say it's the relationship. It's that we've connected them to someone that matters to them. And, I, and I'm gonna say in social media, when we don't do that, we're not gonna get the growth that we wanna see because it's missing. Um, it turns out also from Susanna's data, we know that people get information, for, we obviously know it's not about the doctor. They get information from more than just the doctor, and we want to respect that. So we're in a situation where we know social media adoption is happening, we know personal health records adoption is happening in our, in, where there's a good relationship, and we don't want that to be segregated like that painting. So we want to figure out how we can make it kind of the same so we get the benefit of both. So um, Catherine gets her mammogram. Um, and then just one more thing about our history, Sidney Garfield, the namesake of this facility, in 1970 said this, he said, health education should not only be available, it should be unavoidable. So remember, 1970 was the golden age of medicine. It was you know, um, coronary bypass, CAT scans, all that kind of stuff. So here was a guy in 1970 saying, no, I actually want to, he's a surgeon, by the way, I want to figure out how to educate patients every step of the way. So we get up every day driven by that idea of how do we prevent illness, how do we connect people to the relationship, but also how do we listen and be there for them. So I think we're having today because we want to figure out how to combine those. So that's how we've chosen the people that are going to talk to you. So part four is how can we combine all the goodness? Because um, this, this goodness doesn't exist yet. And that says, that, uh, that, that little lunchbox says, I'm saving up for a unicorn. So we don't know, so this doesn't exist, but we brought four groups of people that are dabbling in this area that want to learn about care delivery and integrated care delivery, and maybe we can have conversations and figure out what it might be like in the next couple of years. So here are the challenges with the current state of, of social networking, social media. Um, we create another persona, Marsha Welbite from Marcus Welby. Um, so she is based on a real physician that I met. She's at um, KP Northwest. She's a family doc. They are piloting the medical home model of care. And when I talk to them, they say what that means is I am learning to lead a team. I'm not doing everything myself. I'm figuring out how to, how to be there for the patient in different ways. Um, like all Permanente physicians, she comes from a great medical school. She's, they're very interested in innovate, innovation. They're compassionate. They're focused on prevention in the population. They walk in saying, how do I keep everyone on my panel healthy? Um, they're, they're not arguing that social media is important. They just don't have the time. And they don't know how to fit it into everything they're doing. And on the right is a quote from Vince Gala, um, who says, again, um, the scary part for me is when I do the math, 8.8 .8 million members times 181,000 physicians times an audience of 750 million on Facebook. I need a creator to figure that out. So as a system, we can't manage those kind of connections that would happen and make them private and secure. That's our challenge. Um, and furthermore, on top of that, um, there are other challenges. So this is Missouri. It's called Aaron's Law. And it was made illegal for, for teachers to have friendship relationships with patients on Facebook. And we could all argue that that's probably not a good idea for us as well. So people message me on Facebook about things related to Kaiser, but I can't ever imagine friending a patient or talking about clinical care with them. Um, people also talk about what are the legal challenges to us being on Facebook. And that's why we brought the group that we brought today, because they, they show a different approach, a different ideal than trying to figure out how to fit ourselves into the Facebook world, which we know um, doesn't support privacy, is not really designed around that, is not designed for the healthcare relationship. And that's OK. There are other options. So social media is bigger than just Facebook, which we love and is totally fine. OK, so what we say happened next. So this is um, from the Kaiser Permanente Center from Total Health in Washington, DC. This is the video panel, and it ends in 2011, and talks about our great accomplishment in um, paperless hospitals. So what is that panel going to say in a year, two years, three years about what we did to um, improve our members' health? And so to do that, um, I was actually watching a tech demo last week from Colorado, which I learned a lot from. And I was watching, sitting with someone from Washington, DC, and she said this quote that I'm putting up here. She said, we were watching other um, people present. She said, Ted, everything for us is about a day in the life of a patient. You know, if, we don't, if it's not framed that way, it's not going to be relevant to me. That's what I want to hear about. So we have three personas up there, and you all have the persona cheat sheet. These are based on a lot of data. They're not made up by accident and interviews. So the three at the top are the dominant ones, Catherine, which I talked about. Um, Nick, I actually don't think Nick, no one, anyone is using Nick, which actually tells you how cool it is. These, these teams are using people that are real, have real issues. Nick is 26. He's a tech worker. He does everything. He wants to be IM'd all the time. He's a low contact member, as we might say. And Maria, 51, a culturally Latina. She doesn't believe fully in pills and MRI. She wants, she's interested in lifestyle wellness. She's super smart. Uh, her mother is Spanish speaking. And then on the bottom are two that, were, that were, are in development. So Ashley is the post-2014 member. Um, she's in transition. She's unemployed. She's overweight. Um, she probably spends more time on job websites than health websites, and that's her priority. And the right is Marsha, which I talked about. So we've asked everyone to three slides in three minutes, start with a persona, start with the problem, solve the problem, a little bit about themselves. It's kind of a dating thing to get you in to see them in the, uh, the gallery walk. 
And then the personas are not enough. You gotta have a real patient. So Diane McNally, please stand up. The member is in the room, everyone. All right, so we have a member at the tech demo. So Diane McNally has been a member for 40 plus years of Northern California and Hawaii. She oversees the health of herself and her husband and her mother. Um, she and her husband were both in a uh, serious car accident about seven years ago. So she has a lot of experience with Kaiser Permanente. And she's offered to come listen, give her perspective, and also just to be in the room because that changes the conversation. So I'm going to encourage you to ask what this is like for her. And I'm going to encourage her to tell us what this would mean for her care. Because her quote there is, I think most of what I learned um, through caregiving is that at my age, it seems you're always involved with someone with chronic medical issues. Either as a friend or family member, you end up being involved. Let me ask who in this audience who is actually engaged in caregiving of someone. So that's about right. They say in any employed populations, about 16% are engaged in caregiving. And it's going to be a, it's going to be a huge issue. And, and those 16% are severely impacted. Um, and so um, that's part of the drive for us to do some of this work. OK. I just want to show this video just to say I gave the example of breast cancer screening. And I want people to know when we talk about care delivery, it's challenging, it's complex, there's a lot to it, there's a lot of problems. So I don't want to just say it's about prevention or wellness, there's a lot there. So I want to show basically, uh, please, people, the people with the jackets, please stand up. So we've got our jackets. You've seen these jackets. So these jackets were part of an event and it's ongoing, um, painted by Regina Holiday, which you'll see. And I also want you to see the Center for Total Health in Washington, D.C., which is where the event was. So I'll just play this and you'll get a sense of just thinking broadly about what care delivery is and how intense it can be. Regina Holiday, artist who found in the Medical Advocacy Mural Project, and the jacket I'm wearing today is Little Miss A-type personality, because that's what the doctor called me while we were hospitalized. And I decided instead of that being a negative name, to embrace the title and work on changing the world through patients' rights, voice, and visual messages. Hello, my name is Frederick Allen Holiday III. My mother is Regina Holiday. She is the one hosting this event, I believe. Inside of 2009, my father died um, from kidney cancer. Painting is called Forest Through the Trees. It's the story of my parents. It talks about the journey people go through when they're cancer patients in a confusing setting. Right now, there's a tectonic shift happening in health information access. And my jacket shows Neo from the Matrix being given the choice of the blue pill and the red pill. The red pill is the pill that we take that gives us access to our data. The blue pill is accepting things the way they are and never having access to this data. Now, part of the walking gallery, though, is that we must walk. I'm a parent and a, a caregiver of a chronically ill son. It's about uh, being in a maze, me and my son, feeling all alone and uh, trying to get people to be more involved in family-centered care, um, letting the parents know that they have a voice in their child's care. My jacket is called Rosetta Stone, and it's a story about reclaiming something that was lost long ago, patient-centric care. My story is about the birth of my baby, Ada, and my real challenge as a mother to make that birth experience as natural and patient and family centered as possible in the context of modern medicine. My son James died at 11 days of age from multiple preventable medical errors. Reggie painted a beautiful piece called Never Enough. There are never enough books. There will be never enough of anything to bring back what we lost. Okay, so we have lots of opportunities. Um, and so we've, we ended on a down note, and we're going to go up because these four presenters are going to show us amazing technology that's going to solve all our problems. Um, 
here's what I want you to do during this, during the gallery walk. So the, we're going to introduce them. They're going to do the three by three. Number one, um, who here is a clinician that takes care of patients? Please stand up. Stand up. I just want people to eyeball them and notice that they're there and seek them out. So when you're in the gallery walk and you want to find a clinician, just look at their faces. What is this like for you in your day? Um, I assume everyone else is not a direct care provider. We're all patients, but clinicians do the same thing. Ask, what, how would this work for you? What's your perspective like on this technology? That's what we want to learn today. Um, share the care with people with the jacket. Ask them what their story is. There's a story for, for every jacket here. And then practice appreciative inquiry. This group is, I would say, not is Kaiser Permanente naive integrated care naive, and that's OK. We want them to learn about what integrated care is like. So when you ask a question and you, see, you feel like they don't know how KB Health Connect is architected or our security model, that's OK. Just try and figure out or, and teach them about what integrated care is. And for our, our four VIPs, five VIPs, same thing. So they're here to learn about what integrated care is like so they can go out into the world and do their amazing work and have that in mind of what it, what it could be like. Um, tweet, hashtag. Um, SM Care Delivery, and add the at KP Garfield, so that's the facility. And then for the remote folks, um, Jan Ground is on WebEx back there. And so just go ahead and chat her. She's going to take note of your questions, and we'll bring that into the Unpanel, which is at 4 PM Pacific time. OK? All right. So we're going to start with Cure Together. You ready? <laughs> 